What a delight. That's a delight. It's a delight. Thank you, May Lynn. You're so welcome. And everybody uh, give her another round of applause. Woo! You know, let's just all go home. You know, <laughs> <laughs> how's everybody doing this morning? Good, good, awesome. good. Oh, all good. right, all right. Today is the third installment in Reflections on Truth. Yay! Featuring uh, truth teachings from Emily Cady, a profound teacher, profound spiritual teacher. And so we're so happy to be. To be bringing this, uh, to be bringing this series to a close. Now, if we all recall, the first message uh, two weeks ago was about basically it was about establishing a foundation, a foundation, a spiritual foundation, uh, in accordance to Unity Truth principles. It was basically initially about taking our consciousness out of the basement. And I'm not going to go over the whole thing, but it was a lot of information there. And then. Um, our second installment, our first installment was called Origins, A Return to Innocent. The second installment was, or second one in the lesson in the Reflections of Truth was entitled Reconstruction, mm -hmm. Rebuilding Our Jerusalem, which dealt with the tools that we use, that Unity uses in order to clean house, in order to get our houses in order, using denials and, and affirmations and acknowledging the power of our faith and how it is the glue or the mortar in the, in the uh, construct of consciousness that we're building in order to rebuild our new Jerusalem. So today's talk is entitled... <laughs> Nobody remember? Nobody remember? Okay, Regeneration and Rebirth. Yeah. A new covenant. That's it. Right. That's it. That's it. You got a name. <laughs> right, right. I'll pass the test. Yeah, you okay, the all right, all right. Okay. So, with Generation and Rebirth, uh, I'd like to start this with a scripture. And this scripture is in the book of John, chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. And Jesus answered him, Very truly, I say to you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown up, after growing old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh, and what is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I tell you, that I said to you, you must be born from above. So what does that mean, being born from above? Because I'm going to give you all a, a metaphysical interpretation of the water and spirit, yes. but just being a born from above, higher consciousness, keeping your mind elevated in higher consciousness. We always have a choice as far as to be in the basement, basement consciousness. Altitude of attitude. Altitude of attitude. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. you so much. <laughs> higher consciousness. You have to be living in that higher place doesn't mean that you don't see the lower place doesn't mean that you don't experience the times where your energy is low but we seek to bring our consciousness to the high so that is what Jesus was talking about without giving any metaphysical interpretation about being born from above but metaphysically metaphysically water represents a cleansing mental potentiality and in some cases life or vital energy. Water also represents the great mass of thoughts that conform to environment. Every thought leaves its form in the consciousness and all the weak characterless words and expressions gather in the subconscious mind as water gathers in holes. Spirit represents God as the moving force in the universe principle as the breath of life in all creation, the principle of life, creative intelligence, and life. So when Jesus said being born of water and spirit, that is what he was referring to. All right. So this is our inheritance. When one concentrates all the faculties of, on truth ideas, the conscious mind and superconscious mind blend, and there is a descent of spiritual energies 
into soul and body. Then the faculties receive new power to express truth, and the body is renewed. That's in the Metaphysical Bible Dictionary. So our inheritance, our covenant made to us by spirit, requires our consent and participation on our part in demonstrating our willingness to live new lives as regenerative spiritual beings. So the first step in the regenerative process is recognizing where we're coming from. Recognizing what consciousness we're actually, we're actually coming from. So A Course in Miracles talks about these two dynamics as fear and love. And Malik Katie talks about these two consciousness or these two dynamics as personality and divine individuality. Personality as far as that part that, that uh, was created after we were born and that part of us that identifies um, as a person, that part of us that identifies as these are my parents and you know this is, this is what I like, I don't like, sp I like spaghetti, I don't like peas and that part of us, you know, that part of us that, that has all the different flavors and things like that. And then there's a divine individuality divine consciousness that is expressing in all beings, individuals. But we need to know where we're coming from. Because many times we're, we, we, we're in our fearful thoughts, we're in our fearful mind, and, and then there's other times where, we, where we're in our, our loving mind. So, the two differences basically are the personality is biased towards finding fault in itself and in others. Divine individuality sees that God is good all the time. And everything that happens is a constant unfolding of that same truth principle. So divine individuality, even when things seem frightening or scary, divine, when you are coming from our divine individuality, our divine individual selves, mm -hmm. even though we see these things, we are not impacted by these things. Because we know that this is all part of a greater unfoldment, a greater truth that just has yet to be brought forth into visibility. Thank God. Thank God. <laughs> so Emily Clayton, what she writes on this is whenever we, she also goes into some distinctions, whenever we fear a man or shrink before him, it is because his personality, being the stronger, overcomes ours. Many timid persons go through life always feeling that they are inefficient, that others are wiser or better than they. They dread to meet a positive, self-possessed person, and when in the presence of such a one, they are laid low just as the field of tall wheat is after a fierce windstorm has swept across it. They feel as though they would like to get out of sight forever. All this, dear timid ones, is not because your fellow really is wiser or better than you, but because his personality, the external man, is stronger than yours. You never have a similar feeling in the presence of strong individuality. Individuality in another not only produces in you an admiration for its superiority, but it also gives you, when you are in its presence, a strange new sense of your own inherent possibilities. A sense that is full of exhilaration and comfort and encouragement to you. This is because a pronounced individuality simply means more of God come forth into visibility through a person. And by some mind process, it has power to call forth more of God through you. If you want to know how to avoid being overcome and thrown off your feet in, in the strong, by the strong personality of others, I will tell you, always remember that personality is of the human and individuality is of God. Silently affirm your own individuality, your oneness with God, and your superior to the personality. Can God fear a person? Hmm. So again, we have to discern where we're coming from, whether we're coming from our personality, which is always skilled at finding what's wrong 
It is so good at finding what's wrong. I tell you what, I mean, I'm serious. It's going to find what's wrong, you know. When there's a will, there's a way. It is going to find out what's wrong. I mean, and we need to understand where we're coming from that. Because it's easy to slip into that. It's so easy. It is so easy. I want to share a recent uh, experience. <laughs> just, just last weekend, as a matter of fact. I was in my personality. Um, I was with colleagues and and we were we were going we were discussing um, our ministry and you know in my personality I felt I felt that I wasn't appreciated I felt that all of the things that I had that I had you know really earnestly attempted to bring to this ministry that it just it just I was just in my personality I was in that negative like you know woe is me like that little kid that's at the sandbox and stuff like that the other kids don't want to play with them and stuff like that and so he has to turn around and, and go home I felt like that kid Aww. that was me <laughs> that was me and so this was right before the night before talk Okay, so I'm tossing and turning, and I'm sitting up here, I'm trying to focus on my talk, I can't really focus on my upcoming talk, you know, because I'm just tossing and turning, because I still have that whole experience in my mind, and I'm like, you know, Spirit, what am I doing here? Why am I here? What is this? And so, I finally was able to go to sleep. And I was able to then wake up and prepare for my Sunday morning message. And so, as we were nearing the time to start the Sunday morning message, when I came from the kitchen into the sanctuary, I saw a person sitting in the back of the sanctuary I'd never seen before. And this person was a congregant who wanted to come and see me talk. And... I was like, hello, how are you? And she was like, hi, I am so grateful to finally be here and, 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 and witness your mess. I just, I love your talks when, when I see you um, and when I'm able to get on Zoom and I see you and things like that. I love your talks and I love when your mom came and all these different things. And I was just like, oh my God, that felt so good. That felt so good. That felt so good. Part of me wanted to cry right then, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I held it together, went ahead and did the talk, all right? And so then afterwards, then, you know, I talked to her a little bit more, and she was just, you know, talking about how, you know, she was just really just excited, and, you know, that there's more people that feel like her, and I was just like, wow, you know, thank you, because, you know, I, I, I just didn't think that, you know, people wanted me here, you know? And so she was like, no, we are so blessed to have you here. We are so blessed to have you here. That was spirit, y'all. Mm -hmm. That was spirit right there. Mm -hmm. Spirit working through someone else mm -hmm. to give me a message. That's what that was. And so then, after that, I got a second confirmation. There's a young man who wanted to speak to me. And he was here. He was working the camera. And so then uh, he's, I had, you know, we had to, I had to, he said, uh, you think you can... Uh, I needed to take care of something for him in the office. And so we went upstairs and said, I want to share something with you. And he said, you know, this ministry and your message is a part of the reason why I moved here. They're part of the reason why I moved here from where I moved here from. And I'm so grateful to be experiencing this ministry, and he also mentioned Earl Purdy, because that's another reason why he came. I'm so grateful to be a part of these ministries. He did not know that these were things that I needed to hear, because I was in my personality. I was in my personality. I know you've been in your personality. Well, you know something? Spiritual leaders, ministers get in our personality too, okay? <laughs> so there's no different. We get in our personality. And so I was in my and I needed that. Thank you so much, brother. I certainly appreciate that. And then just after that, after taking care of administrative duties um, in church business, I came down to hear the rest of Earl's talk. And after the, cut the last minutes of his talk, Earl Purdy. And... So after that, one of the 
students, one of the people that were there, came to me and said, you know, I've been watching everything that's been happening in this ministry since you've been here, and you are really doing the thing. And I just wanted you to know that I see what you're doing. That was three confirmations. I didn't ask for these things. But in a way I did. Yeah, yeah, in a way you did. In a way I did. <laughs> <laughs> and Spirit lovingly answered. Mm -hmm. And so after that, I couldn't take it anymore. I went into my room, I called my mother, and I cried. I cried. I cried for hours. I cried. I was just crying. Because it felt so good. These were tears of joy. That's what they were, tears of joy. And then, after speaking to my mentor, later on in the week, she then gave even me even more clarification. She said, Stephen, I want you to understand something. That there are many people at that church right now that are still going through grieving for Sheila Gaylord. So just understand that. Don't take it personal. I know you can, you can, it might, you might take it personal. I get it. I get it. It's not hard. I mean, it's not easy. I know it's not easy what you're going through. But just be there for them. Be present there for them. Because they are going through grief right now. And so right when she told me that, I felt joy and compassion. Because I was like, oh, I didn't know that. I mean, I realized that, but I thought, you know, when we had the celebration service, you know, that, that kind of moved us towards a better... No, no, grief lasts. And for some, it lasts longer than, than, than others. And so I'm truly grateful for these experiences. I wanted to share these things with you. I want to share these things authentically with you. Thank you. Absolutely. So when we come from our divine nature expressing individually as individually we know that we are perfectly safe everything is either an expression of love or a cry for it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that God is good all the time all the time God is good and in order to experience more of this level of our divine being, we must learn to relinquish our attachments to the selfish point of view in order to step into a consciousness that is more inclusive of not only our well-being, but the well-being of others. Now, this is naturally where spirit abides. This is where spirit abides normally. And when we raise our consciousness, we can feel it, we can see it, we can experience it. We come from this place in consciousness, then, and we see evidence. Um, well, this is what we're being called to. This is what we're being called to. So the personality must decrease so that divine individuality may increase. Again, the personality must decrease so that joy, peace, harmony, and love may increase. So let's move on to the next thing. Let's move on to the spirit. The, the good part, as a matter of fact. Now we're going to get to the good part. Now that we've, we've discussed the personality and divine individuality, let's move on to the good part, which is spiritual understanding and spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts. Yeah, we're getting to that. So spiritual understanding comes from our intuition. As we are seeking truth and thus focus our awareness on divine mind. So it's just like, um, for example, when we lost a set of keys. And we're looking everywhere for these keys. We're looking for these keys. We're just looking for them. And then this flash, this image comes into our mind exactly where these keys are. And then we go and there. That's where they were. Now, it's the same thing when we are seeking truth, when we are seeking a higher spiritual understanding. That intuition will then give us flashes, which those flashes are revelations of truth. And they are transformative. They transform. They have transformative energy. Let's read a little bit, of that, a little bit from Emily Cady. Understanding is a spiritual birth, a revelation of God within the heart of man. 
Jesus touched the root of the matter when, after having asked the apostle a question, that the apostles a question that was answered variously according to the intellectual perception of the men, he asked another question to which Peter gave a reply not based on external reasoning, but on the intuition. He said to Peter, Blessed art thou, Simon, bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father who is in heaven. You may have an intellectual perception of truth, you may easily grasp with the mind the statement that God is the giver of all good gifts, life, health, love, just as people have for centuries grasped it. Or you may go further and intellectually see that God is not only the giver, but the gift itself, that he is life, health, love in us. But unless truth is revealed unto thee, by my Father who is in heaven, which is in Matthew uh, chapter 16, verse 17, it is of no practical benefit to you or to anyone else. This is revelation of truth to the consciousness of a person is spiritual understanding. So this revelation of truth to the consciousness of a person is spiritual understanding. Again, revelation. So when you use that, that, that into, we can apply that intuition to anything. To anything. Like I said, we can apply it to a, you know, finding a pair of keys. Or we can apply it to truth to understanding spiritual principles, it works just the same. So I want you to think of, if you want to experience more spiritual understanding, you know, because it comes infrequently, you know, like, you know, it'll pop up maybe, you know, once a day for some of us, others once a week or whatever, but if you want to experience more of it, I want you to imagine spiritual understanding as some green pastures and meadows and lakes and beautiful flowers and you know I want you to imagine spiritual understanding is that and the only thing preventing you from seeing it is this wall that's in your way that's the only thing preventing you <laughs> now this wall consists of our assumptions about things it consists of our attachments which cause us to be motivated and have agendas and things like that, which prevent us from seeing and interpreting clearly. And it consists of our expectations, thinking that things have to be or should be a certain way, which prevent us from actually taking in how they are. So that wall consists of all of those things. And so in order to see because, see, Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is here now. He didn't say after you die. He didn't say anything like that. He said it was right here, right there. It was around us. You just have to see it. So in order to see the kingdom of heaven, in order to see, have spiritual understanding, in order to see those pastures and those meadows and flowers and lakes and things like that, we have to divest our energy into the, into the assumptions and realize, you know something, we really don't know a lot at all in the grand plan. We really don't know anything when it really comes to the grand plan. We really don't. And so the acknowledgement of that makes us open to information that our assumptions blind us to. And then relinquishing those attachments, those, those motivations and things like that, and things that, you know, things kind of need to be this way or, or, or well, I, I, I want to have this and things like that, just kind of relinquishing those things and basically putting our, if you want to have any attachment to anything, have attachment to spirit. They're just misplaced attachments, that's all. Have an attachment to spirit. Spirit won't let you down. And then those expectations, how things should be, where you want to populate everything in your experience, how, what should happen. Like if, this, if I speak good morning, if I say good morning to this person, this person better say good morning back to me. And if I do this, they better do that. That prevents you from seeing. That's part of that wall. That prevents you from seeing that kingdom of heaven, that pasture that's on the other side of that wall. So as you begin to divest these, as you begin to relinquish these things, that wall begins to become transparent. And then what you begin to see on the other side of that wall is something that is truly beautiful indeed. Truly beautiful. Absolutely. Amen. Can I get a minute? Can I get an amen? amen? All right. All right. That's what I'm talking about. We're about to get like a, a, a Baptist church up in here. <laughs> All right. Okay. Amen. So, the next thing, now we're going to talk about the real good part. We're going to talk about spiritual gifts. I know you've probably been waiting on that. We know about these spiritual gifts and stuff like that. Well, you know, everybody has spiritual gifts. Everybody has them. 
And some of us, they are, they are latent potentials. And in some of us, they are actually expressing. Some of us, some of us are mis misapplying them and things like that. But I'm going to read it read a little bit. But I just want to give you a little idea. So they are there. We're born with these things. We are born with these things. Now, these latent potentials then become actual potentials once we do the work. And if we already are experiencing our spiritual gifts as we do the work, then those spiritual gifts become more pronounced and become stronger and we gain more control over them and then we're able to do more good. So, what is the work? What is the work? Well, the work is... The same things that we talked about over the past two talks. All right. Number one, making a choice how you want to live. Do you want to live free or do you want to live a slave to limitation? Number two, taking time for daily meditation. That's the work. Number three, cultivating within us that which we, we, that which we desire to see in the external. We got to cultivate the first here. Number four. Replacing our external searching with trust in spirit within. Number five, creating and adhering to a daily regimen of denials and affirmations in order to clean house, in order to impact those core beliefs. Number six, moving away from the selfish motivations of our personality consciousness. And number seven, relinquishing our assumptions, attachments, and expectations in order to experience spiritual understanding. The work, brothers and sisters, that's what I'm talking about, the work. So when we do the work, we experience more of our spiritual gifts. So I'm gonna read what uh, Emily K. well, no, actually I'm gonna read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse four through 11, where it talks about spiritual gifts. Now, there are, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of services, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it is of the same God who activates all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given, through the Spirit, the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discernment of spirit, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are, act are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each individually just as, spirit, as the Spirit chooses. Emily Cady she reads, the same spirit, always and forever the same, and one God, one spirit, but in the different forms of manifestation. The gift of healing is no more, no greater than the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is no greater than faith. For faith, when it, for faith, when it is really God faith manifested through us, even as a grain of mustard seed shall be able to remove mountains. The working of miracles is no greater than the power of discerning, discerning, discerning spirits or the thoughts and intents of other men's hearts, which are open always to spirit. And greatest of all of these is love. Love never faileth to melt down all forms of sin, sorrow, sickness, and trouble. Love never faileth. But all of these worketh the one in one and the same spirit, dividing to each one severally even as he will severally okay for as the body is one all the members of the body being many one body so also is christ okay so we are all limitless beings all of us limitless beings but you know, it occurred to me when I was actually writing this talk that maybe, maybe we're tired of hearing that we're limitless beings because no one's actually giving us proper context of what limitless being or, you know, what does that mean? What, what does that really mean? I mean, the only thing we really have for limitless being is like what Jesus did in the Bible pretty much. I mean, people really don't get into the whole idea of shedding light on what limitlessness is. So I'm going to do that. 
I'm going to do that by sharing a, a story. So, back in 2014, I owned a uh, trucking business. And so, one of my drivers took sick and had to be rushed to the hospital. Now, I own this trucking business along with a, a business partner. And so, I tried to cancel the load. This was actually a load going to Denver, to believe it or not. Mm -hmm. And so, I tried to cancel this load. And so, the broker told me that at this point, contractually, we were bound to take the load to Denver. Okay? Now, my, my driver's going to be down for a week to two weeks. So, my business partner had a CDL, but he couldn't drive a manual transmission, okay? Me, I was working to get my CDL learner's permit, all right? So somehow I got the idea. I said, you know something? I could drive a manual transmission. I could do that, you know? And so I, I just got this crazy idea that we would do it together, and I would go get my learner's permit, and then we would take this truck full, uh, 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 with a load to Denver. All right, okay. Now, <laughs> okay, so here we go. And this is just the beginning. Here we go. So, now I've always been taught by my mother that I, could, that I could do anything. She instilled it into me. I believe it. She brainwashed me, basically, to believe that it was true. And so I never doubted myself because of how, of, you know, all her always teaching me that I could do anything. You know, but an 18-wheeler? Really? Okay. So, I went the next day to the DMV office and took the test. And after an hour, I walked out of there with my CDL learner's permit, okay? So then at that point, I went home and I said, okay, well, I don't know. I said, these 18 wheelers have about 20 gears, up to 20 gears. It's not like a, a, a five speed or a six speed or something like that. So I went on YouTube and then looked at the shifting patterns for the type of transmission that I had just to familiarize myself with it. And then I later on went to sleep and dozed off. I had to get up the next morning at 4 a.m. because we had to go get the load at 6. All right. Now, what happened next? continues to amaze me as I even just relive it for you. During the evening, my mind was connected with other minds. And for, I don't know how long the experience was, but I was, it was like I was in truck driving school. And so, I, you know, I was driving, I, I learned how to drive in the mountains and on open roads, and I learned how to, to downshift, and I learned about all sorts of things in this dream. I was connected, I could hear the voices of the, instructor, of the instructors, I, I learned how to turn that 18-wheeler and corner in, in, in the streets, and I learned how to just, just corner and, and clear the trailer, and, and I learned all of these things. In my dream. I don't know how long this took. I don't know how long this dream. But when I woke up. At 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. I woke up. An experienced veteran truck driver. Now when I woke up. I felt this feeling of a duality. Like I was in dual realities. When I woke up. As I was washing my face to brush my teeth. And in one reality. You know I was excited to be driving a truck for the first time. And in another reality, I've been doing this for years. Mm. When I met up with my friend at the truck to go get the truck to go, and go get the load, I asked him to drive because I was still trying to get used to this dual reality feeling. I was trying to get used to it. I thought he couldn't drive manual. Let me finish the story. Let me finish the story. <laughs> so after 10 minutes, thank you, Avalu, after 10 minutes, <laughs> of agonizingly hearing the grinding of the gears and stuff like that while he's struggling, I asked him to pull over. <laughs> and so, the rest of this is history. And I drove that truck like a seasoned, professional, veteran truck driver. <laughs> we took that load all the way to Denver. Now, my friend did not even believe it. My friend said, you've been holding out on me. 
You've been holding out on me. There's no way <laughs> that you know how to drive this 18-wheeler. There is no way that you know how to drive this 18-wheeler. What was I to tell him? What was I to tell him? I, I, I kind of held out on it, and I, I, until, and I waited, and I waited until we were unloaded, we were getting unloaded at Denver, and then I finally confessed that I learned it during an intense dream, and of course he didn't believe that either. He didn't believe that either, and during the way home, I taught him, I was his instructor, and taught him how to drive that 18-wheeler. Isn't God good? In the book of Psalms, chapter 82, verse 6, you are gods, children of the Most High. That's the explanation for it. Mm -hmm. We are gods. Accept it. Know thyself. So I invite you to reflect on these things. I invite you to reflect on this story I told you, just to give you an idea that we literally have no limit that years worth of experience happened in a six to eight hour dream. Imagine that. Imagine that. So brothers and sisters, I invite you to accept your, inherit your inheritance. Know thyself, because I already know who you are. I know who you are. And the reason why I know who you are is because I know who I am. I know who you are. I know what you're capable of. Because. Whatever it is that I did, you can do all of that and do it better. And do it better. And I truly believe that. So in knowing thyself, let us all begin to experience together what limitlessness, having no limit, truly means. Now, brothers and sisters, go and be that light that your father, mother, God intended for you to be. Thank you. Now, oops, wait a minute. <laughs>